Hello and welcome to the IND podcast. I'm your host, Dennis Dunicic, and this is our last episode of the week. So I want to remind you to subscribe to our channel to stay in the loop on the most important relevant global affairs that are occurring today. Our main story today is concerning Myanmar or the Myanmar crisis and the dilemma that ASEAN or the Association of Southeast Asian Nations has been facing with its upcoming annual summit that's going to be occurring between October 26th and October 28th. 28th. Now, mainly the issue that ASEAN has been facing is whether or not to invite and allow the current de facto military leaders in Myanmar to visit and partake in this summit. Now, I need to give you some background to understand exactly what's going on. Some of you may or may not know, but previously before this year, Myanmar was more or less a democratic country. At the very least, it elected its democratic leaders, presidents, and parliament. Now, in February 1st of this year, the military decided to overthrow this democratically elected government and during this time has instituted a period of a military wanta. Now, the military wanta and the government, which is currently under the leadership of Min Aung Hlaing, has promised that it is going to hold elections within a year. Now, nonetheless, this has concerned the global and international community. The reason why is because Myanmar has a history of being run under a military authoritarian regime. Now, Myanmar very successfully managed to transition to a more or less democratic society, which was under the leadership of Nobel Peace Prize laureate Aung San Suu Kyi. Now, the military felt that it was losing power and losing control. And on February 1st of this year, it decided to overthrow Aung San Suu Kyi, who as of that date has been under military detention. And the entire global community has been putting pressure on this military government to come up with some form of compromise and retransition the country, Myanmar, into a democracy again. And this is a huge issue and a lot of the pressure has been put on ASEAN. Now, the Association of Southeast Asian Nations is in fact an economic trading bloc. It was invented with the goal to create an institute and grow economic cooperation between its 10 member states. Now, the 10 member states of ASEAN are in fact some of the world's fastest growing economies. And ASEAN in and of itself has become more than just an economic powerhouse. And now they're actually being faced with a dilemma. Do they stay as an economic trading bloc or do they begin to interfere in the the politics of its member nations? Now, ASEAN in fact does actually not have that much ability to influence the politics of its member nations. It does have a clause where it very clearly states that it will not interfere in the domestic issues of any member or observer nation. In addition to this, any proposal law or new sanction or new kind of a proposal, as I mentioned at the beginning, that is taken on by ASEAN has to be passed through a consensus, meaning unanimous voting. 10 out of 10 member states have to vote for any type of proposal to go through, meaning one member state can say no and nothing happens. Now, theoretically, if ASEAN were to institute some kind of economic sanctions or a yellow card or warnings against Myanmar, Myanmar itself can vote against it and nothing happens. But that isn't the main issue right now. The main issue that's occurring today And this month is the ASEAN summit that's happening between October 26th and 28th, which is actually going to be visited by a very special guest, Joe Biden. The summit is actually going to be virtual and occur online. However, it is the yearly and largest summit of the member nations. Now, the conundrum that exists is whether or not to invite the de facto leader of Myanmar right now, which is Min Aung Hlaing, who is the military leader and the the major general in Myanmar. The problem here is if he is invited to attend this summit, it can come off as a form of international recognition of the military wanta, which no one wants to do. Virtually every country that interacts with Myanmar wants the country to transition back into a democracy. Now that being said, the military obviously does not want to give up its power. And right now, Myanmar is going through a crisis because of this. Following February 1st, the military wanta and the confusion that followed, it is estimated that around 1,100 innocent civilians have lost their lives. So a lot of innocent and pointless bloodshed has occurred. In addition to this, 
Myanmar is an extremely wealthy country filled to the brim with resources. However, the people of Myanmar do not actually enjoy this wealth. Most of the wealth and resources are actually held in the hands of the military regime and its supporters. So the military government has carried out a massive level of corruption, virtually stealing from its people. Now, we don't have enough time to go into details of what I'm about to mention now, but the military has also been involved in what was considered what was called the Rohingya crisis, which was more or less an ethnic cleansing of Islamic minorities in Myanmar. Now, the military has an absolutely terrible track record when it comes to economic honesty, not taking part of corruption, and in fact, has committed major violations of human rights. So how did it come to power? Even if any organization, whether it's the military, a political party, a very charismatic leader, comes and institutes a non-democratic or authoritarian government, they still have to have a significant amount of support from the population, or there would simply be massive uprisings and they would be overthrown. Even Saddam Hussein was beloved by his significant amount of his people. So was Muammar Gaddafi, and so is the Kim family. That's just the reality, and that is how dictators maintain power, or authoritarian regimes maintain power. The military, despite all of its flaws and serious issues, is still very popular in Myanmar. And for a very good reason, the military has instituted, even though what has occurred under its regime has been terrible and a lot of human rights violations, it has instituted more or less peace and stability. Myanmar without military rule would essentially be hell. Chaos would spread. And I am not supporting the military regime of Myanmar. But I do agree with most leaders of ASEAN. They believe that the military and the democratic actors that previously ruled Myanmar or were administrating Myanmar, the democratically elected government that was under Aung San Suu Kyi, should come to some form of compromise to kind of slow down the democratic transition. Now keep in mind, when the military gave up power and allowed democratic elections, it was hailed as one of the fastest and most successful transitions from authoritarian, authoritarian, authoritarian regime to a democratic country. But maybe it was too fast. Whenever you transition from one political system to another, there are going to be issues. And that is an extremely delicate and complex and one of the most complicated things to successfully achieve in politics. Most countries that transition, whether it's their economic system or their political system, fail miserably. Now, most ASEAN states and most other international uh, actors, including the United Nations and the European Union, have stated and urged the different parties in Myanmar, being on one side the military and the other side the previously democratically elected government, to come to another compromise and to create a new slower transition, to reinstate the democratic government that was there previously before February 1st, but to allow the military to still have a significant amount of influence on the political life. Not full influence, not to be an authoritarian military regime and not full power, but to still be there to ensure stability and peace in Myanmar until the country is able to spread its resources and develop more economically and give people a better life. Then Myanmar would actually probably be ready to have a full democracy. Now, the reason that ASEAN has actually now stated that it's probably not going to invite Min Aung Hlaing, the leader of the military wanta in Myanmar, to the summit that's occurring at the end of this month is because this week, the ASEAN sent Brunei's second foreign minister, Ervin Youssef, as an envoy to Myanmar as an attempt to go and visit Aung San Suu Kyi and see exactly what's going on and see what kind of bridges could be made to recreate a democratic transition. Now, Erwin Youssef, who was the envoy of ASEAN, was going to visit Myanmar and do this. However, his hosts, the military government, told him that's not going to be possible. Last minute, they told him he would not be able to meet with Aung San Suu Kyi, who, keep in mind, is currently under military detention. She is under arrest and being charged 
with crimes. Now, the crimes she's being charged with are election manipulation and violating coronavirus safety precautions by holding uh, elections right before she was overthrown. Now, when Aung San Suu Kyi, the other side of the Myanmar crisis, and her voice can't even be heard, it shows ASEAN that the military wanta is not ready to compromise. And if it's not ready to compromise, it has no business being at the table. Other propositions have been proposed to allow Min Aung Hlaing, the leader of the military wanted to attend the summit, but not speak, which would actually be kind of a good political ploy. It would allow Hlaing to be in attendance while different ASEAN members criticized what's going on in Myanmar or to just simply not invite him and put more pressure for there to be compromise. Now, before we end the podcast, I want to state that this is an extremely important issue, especially for ASEAN. Now, ASEAN is representing one of the world's most successful economic trading blocks. As I mentioned at the beginning of our podcast, the 10 nations that are member states of ASEAN are some of the world's fastest growing economies. It is turning rapidly turning into an economic giant. Any form of regionable, regional instability can significantly harm this economic growth and this economic production. It could completely throw this all away. Now, this domestic issue in Myanmar can begin to spill over and cause a regional crisis. Now, there really aren't a lot of good guys in this story, especially when looking at the military who has a horrible human rights track record and a significant history of corruption. But it has been shown that the military has to have some part of the political life in Myanmar to avoid coups and to avoid a complete authoritarian, authoritarian, wow, my English is not that good, authoritarian, Let's just say tyrannical regime. That word is easier to pronounce. A tyrannical regime. In order to avoid this, the military has to have a seat at the table, at least for now. And I stated my belief that there should be a new compromise to create a better transition of power. Eventually, Myanmar will have a full democracy without so much influence from the military. But for now, they clearly want and need a seat at the table. And if they don't have it, they'll take full power. But tell me what you think. Let's have a nice little discussion in the comments and see what you think the future of Myanmar could look like. I want to thank you for tuning in with us this entire week and today. I'm going to be seeing you guys next Monday. Have a good weekend and stay safe. <laughs>